you. Thank you for that warm welcome and warm introduction, Melanie. Um, and we're just delighted to be partnering with the Glembo again. Um, in 2013, we sent our exhibition Fairy Tales, Monsters, and the Genetic Imagination and um, here to Calgary, and that was a successful partnership, and we're delighted to be here six years later with um, this major exhibition devoted to um, Nick Cave. Uh, Nick, of course, is an internationally acclaimed um, art superstar. I am going to quote you all in some of your marketing materials. When I first saw it, you know, the curator and me was like, oh, we don't like to use words like that. But I think we can all agree that Nick Cave is indeed a, um, a superstar. And um, it's really exciting to have this first a monographic exhibition uh, here in Canada. Um, for those of you who've seen the exhibition, I think uh, you'll agree with me that it's a very, a very special show, truly like no other that we've presented at the Frist, and we hope that it will be as well received here in Calgary as it was in Nashville and the other venues. I think it's important to note that um, when the Frist began planning this show, and perhaps because Nick is such a superstar, we uh, were on a long list of being able to work with him on a project like this. We first began talking to him in the studio in 2011, I think it was, and our exhibition didn't actually come to, uh, didn't open until 2017. We didn't really plan on traveling the show, um, but without sending a single proposal to another um, institution we have built this, I guess we could call it international tour with four other venues and we've had to turn down at least 10 other um, museums who have expressed interest. I, even, I stopped even telling you about the, the other ones because like, right. we're not going to do it. But, um, but anyway, it's been a real honor over these last years, Nick, working so closely with you and I just want to appreciate the, the time, the thoughtfulness, the energy that you've given to this, this project. Um, your work makes a really big difference in the world. And um, I know in Nashville, as I told you the other night, um, so often I'm out and about in the community. Um, often it seems like in, in Uber cars where somebody will tell me that they've, um, that they experienced the show and that it really was impactful. So thank you for sharing your work with us. So um, you all, many of you probably know that Nick's work is really a, a seamless combination of sculpture, dance, and fashion. And that's really a blending of genres that ref reflects his biography. Um, as Melanie mentioned, he has an MFA from the Cranbrook Academy, but he also studied dance with the Alvin Ailey Company um, for a bit. And I always think it's very interesting that you teach in the fashion department in Chicago, not in sculpture. And I know that you um, have had a successful career as a designer and had your own shop and collection for many years too. Um, part of why I think he, um, he is such a successful artist and someone who is in such high demand is that because on the one hand, the works can just be enjoyed for just their their aesthetic beauty. You don't have to have an art history degree. You know, people from all different backgrounds can come and just enjoy the, the colors and the textures and, and the patterns, just a purely visual experience. Um, the way he reuses um, uh, everyday items, domestic uh, items like buttons and beads um, and other objects that he finds in thrift stores. But then on the other hand, um, you can go deeper and you can really um, explore some important social um, issues, specifically ones that have to do with identity, um, racism, police brutality, gun violence, some really big um, issues that are particularly impacting the United States right now. Um, so Nick works in a variety of mediums, uh, installation, video, and performance are some, which you'll see a bit of in our exhibition, but he is most well known for human-shaped sculptures that he calls sound suits, and I have some examples of those here for you. Um, this is an installation shot of feet at the frist, and here's another one where you can see this really dramatic um, beginning to the exhibition with this runway. 
Um, this is feet at the Akron Museum in Ohio, where it was before it came here. Um, so, Nick, I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the origins of the sound suit. I know it's a question you've answered many times before, um, and what sparked their creation. Uh, hi, everyone, by the way. Um, <laughs> Did I talk too much? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, keep talking. All right, all right. <laughs> Just use up this time. Oh, goodness. You know I can. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but, um, uh, you, know, uh, th you know, the original sound suit sort of came out of um, the Rodney King incident, which was in 92, um, which then led to the LA riots. And for me... And since we're in Canada... Does everyone know what the... Okay, it's great. Just making sure. Okay. Thank God. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Just checking. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I think for me, and prior to that, this is right after I had sort of graduated, maybe two years after I had completed my master's from Cranbrook. And so prior to that, I was doing large construction paintings, uh, so that's, you know, just to sort of set the sort of stage in terms of my practice. Um, but it was that incident that just really flipped everything upside down for me. Uh, uh, thinking, you know, that was the first sort of recorded incident, mm -hmm. uh, which really changed the face of how we sort of saw ourselves in, in, in the world. Um, and particularly black men. And so for me, I was just sort of, you know, struggling with that sort of question, like, you know, uh, identity being profiled and, and um, not sure what that feeling uh, felt like to be sort of discarded, viewed less than, and sort of was sort of just trying to grapple with all of this over a long period of time. And I happened to be in the park and I saw this twig on the ground. And for me, that was the catalyst for the first sound suit. I don't know, I just started, I started proceeding to sort of collect all of the twigs. Mm -hmm. So I had to come back with a cart and you know, what have you. <laughs> but, um, so I started to collect all this material, went back to the studio and was, and started to build this sculpture. I don't know why I didn't think that I could put it on. It just didn't dawn on me mm -hmm. until it was complete. And then I put it on and started to move in it, and it made sound. And so, which then led me to think about the role of protest. And in order to be heard, you've got to speak louder. And so it just started to, everything started to come together. Everything started to make sense. And I think that that sort of discarded object, um, you know, I sort of, you know, at the end of the day was building this sort of suit of armor, something mm -hmm. to protect myself from the outside world, um, uh, hiding gender, race, class. Um, and so that was the beginning of a body of work that I was physically ready to sort of produce, but mentally I wasn't ready hmm. to sort of present it to the world. I think what happened was that, you know, I sort of had photographed like a series of maybe 12 works, figurative works, and, and I had sent them off for some publications or something, and it was on the cover of a magazine. Mm. And I just was like, oh my God, I'm not quite ready with getting behind what this all means. Um, and basically, I sort of went underground for 10 years with that work and then started doing other work, working in other materials um, and mediums. And, um, but yet, you know, this was like this looming sort of dark cloud over my head following me everywhere that I went. Um, and then eventually I came back around to to the work once I sort of understood the magnitude mm -hmm. of it. I think the first sound suit, when I, when I saw it, I knew that I was in trouble. <laughs> At that moment, I was like, I just, it, it, something about it was, was 
bigger than I possibly had ever imagined. Mm -hmm. And you know, and I'm not sketching here. Like none of none of the sounds that's sort of happened through sketching. It's really sort of impulse of objects and materials uh, that sort of provoke a way of building uh, the work. Um, and so then it was. I just had to catch up. Just catch up with everything. That's um, interesting. I've never heard you. I, I wasn't aware of that gap. I mean, I guess I should have kind of thought it through. You know, ninety-two to when most of the sound suits are dated. But I didn't realize that you had to kind of take a moment. It sounds like you knew that there were they were very powerful objects, and the time needed to be right to really unleash them. Well, yeah, and I just needed to be ready to stand behind the work in. Right. You know, I think what happened was, I think, you know, I think we move through the world and we think that our conscience is awake. And I think with the Rodney King incident, it really woke my consciousness up in mm -hmm. this way that it never, I never sort of, I thought I was there. I thought I was present, but mm -hmm. well, I and wasn't. Sadly, um this is an issue that, you know, almost 30 years later, we're certainly still grappling with in the States in particular. Um, I remember during one of your visits to Nashville, um, I think it was Philando Castile had just been mm -hmm. killed. And, you know, we were hearing the news and as we were driving around Nashville and we ended up going to a Black Lives Matter um, rally. rally. And I think just the the weight of that, that here we were, you know, you're planning for another project, and yet this issue is still very much alive, and your work is still relevant, and there must be, you know, a weight to that for you wanting to move beyond this, and yet it well, would that, be hard. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting to think about it in terms of, you know, it's, it's yes, there's other ideas, of but... Course. Uh, but yes, yet I'm still sort of responding to these sort of same issues. Yes. Uh, and I will continue to be because it's what I am responsible for mm -hmm. in terms of here to do. Uh, and, uh, but I'm moving, mm -hmm. I'm moving about, oh, opening things up a bit more. Yes. Well, and I certainly don't mean to imply, I, I know that you do much more than sound shoots, as our exhibition um, demonstrates, um, but those seem to be like an anchor that you return to as needed. Um, so our exhibition, speaking of other works, oh, here's um, a selection or an installation shot from the Cranbrook Museum, uh, a big show in 2016, um, and an exhibition at the Denver Art Museum. And in where it's all the button sound suits, which I think are just so beautiful. And in that exhibition is when you first created the button walls, I believe, <laughs> which are um, also included. Why do you all get excited about that button wall? I, I love know. those button walls. I'm I just do. Like, From the beginning, you know, I like those. I'm like, okay. Well, <laughs> well, what I really like about them, and I'll let you talk about them is my understanding is that for you it's just meant to create this environment that you walk into as a visitor and you're kind of immediately transported to someplace special and different and not your ordinary art gallery experience and I'm wondering if maybe you could share a little bit about what those um, wonderful button walls mean to, to you what they remind you of well you know I think you know because I think this is at the Dimmer Art Museum and and in this particular space, it was very sort of, uh, the space was sort of long, but somewhat uh, narrow. And I really wanted to sort of encapsulate uh, uh, this body of work. And, and so it was really sort of creating this sort of sanctuary of, of sorts. Uh, and so the button wall really sort of became this sort of, um, uh, sort of constellation of sorts, uh, but really it was just there as 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 to set the tone, the backdrop for the work. I don't see it as a artwork. Mm. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you told me once, and I maybe I've just latched onto this um, that 
they, it, it is a constellation and it kind of reminds you of your childhood when you and your brothers would, you know, lay in, in the fields in, in Missouri and just kind of look up at the sky and kind of that sense of wonder and that idea of um, letting go and al allowing our imaginations to really, um, you know, really take hold. I think all of us today feel sometimes overwhelmed by our to-do lists and all the, you know, our phones and just kind of escaping that a little bit and uh, allowing ourselves to be present with your, your artwork. So when I see those, maybe that's what I um, really enjoy thinking about are those times where we can just kind of recharge and um, really get lost in the, in the art. Um, so let's see, what else do we have here? So most of your sound suits are made for static presentation in an exhibition, but um, select ones are also made to be performed in, and we'll talk a little bit more about your performances in a bit. Um, and some are also meant to be worn in videos. Mm -hmm. So this is a just a still screen from um, Drive-By, one Drive -by. of your earliest yeah. videos. Um, and then here's a shot of the one in our exhibition, which is really quite different than your other videos as I see it. Do you want to tell um, people a little bit about what they'll see in Blot? Well, what you will see in Blot, uh, you know, I think most of the videos, the interesting thing about the videos is that I try to sort of create these videos where it's really just one take. Like there is absolutely hardly any editing. Mm -hmm. And so with Blot, it's really just one take. Uh, and it's really sort of, uh, I don't know, blot is like my, uh, it is like my core. Mm. It's sort of, it's this sort of, the sound is, this, it comes from the actual sound suit. But it's really sort of this organic sort of form that just continues to sort of unfold and read defined, redeforms itself. And so for me, it's sort of, uh, but the sound is so like hypnotic that you are just like, you just want, you just settle in to mm -hmm. it. And so for me, it's, it's sort of like what I do every day in terms of, of, you know, things, ways in which I sort of condition myself. Mm -hmm. uh, to sort of be sort of grounded and settled. And I'm totally drawn to it as well. And I, I feel like it's different than some of your other videos and that there is just a single figure that he's wearing a completely black sound suit, that there isn't music. But as you say, it's just the sound of the raffia kind of moving throughout the air. And it becomes very meditative. And, you know, it's really hard to take your eyes off of it, it's. I've said before that it almost reminds me of looking at the being at the beach and looking at the waves. You know, just constantly coming in, different every time, but still, um, obviously the same properties. But you know, I think it's also you know it's very dark. So you know, I think tragedy. For me, I think tragedy. Sometimes you have to, in order to sort of sort of put it in perspective, you have to just get quiet and sort of, so it's like this sort of, it's, it's that, but it's this other thing that has to happen sort of at the same time in order to, for everything to sort of make sense. Okay. Well, and the, the, the title blot, my understanding is that that refers to the Rorkstat tests, the psychological, um, you all yeah. know those ink tests where people see things um, or they interpret them in their own way and that that really kind of speaks to this, well, your work in general, certainly, that you, it's important to you that um, viewers kind of come and in interpret things on their own way with their own narrative and kind of background shaping that experience. And I think that's especially true with our show, Feet. And um, this title came about, um, again, a few years ago. We were in Chicago, and you were asking about um, Nashville and wanting to get to know a little bit more about it as a city. And I think I said something about how, oh, well, you know, we're Music City, and there's a really talented musician on every street corner. 
And then you commented that, yeah, but how many of them ever get, you know, the stage of the Ryman or the Grand Old Opry? And this idea of, um, well, feat is, of course, an, a reference to accomplishments and the vast amount of work that goes into creating your objects that are super labor intensive. Um, but also it's a nod to the way um, acts are often listed in promotional materials for bands mm -hmm. and such. But here, the idea is that you wanted every visitor to be the one that's being fe featured, their story, their narrative, and that you wanted everyone to kind of see a little bit of themselves in, in the art. And that's why we, um, you, designed this amazing title wall with feet being mirrored. And I guess um, maybe you could share a little bit more about why it's important to you for visitors to kind of just come and experience the works directly without too much mediation? Despite the fact that that's what I'm kind of doing <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> well, you know, I think also feet really was, you know, there's this really sort of large performance component to this exhibition. Yes. Uh, so where, you know, my team, we tend to sort of bring a project to a city and then we just hire the city to build the project. So it was really, Feet also is about featuring local talent yes. um, and uh, creating this sort of vast sort of platform uh, uh, for possibility. And so it was amazing working in Nashville, creating this incredible performance, working with over... 300? It was, yes, a huge group, well over 300. Uh, participants involved in, in the performance component. Mm -hmm. um, but I think with any exhibition, I think that, you know, it's, uh, you know, you, you know, I don't really have much to tell you about uh, the show as opposed to it's important that you you know, you find yourself in ways to sort of enter the work and that there's a lots of, of imagery, there's lots of material to sort of connect with and identify with that, <coughs> bless you, that um, really opens up sort of really interesting sort of conversations that I think we can all sort of connect to and find uh, ways to engage ourselves with, with uh, the work. Yeah, definitely. I think for those of you who've seen the show yet, you know, everyone sees some of those objects that you upcycle into your work and can have some connection with those. You remember your parents or your grandparents or there's, there is some association. So it is a good um, a way to kind of connect everybody. Um, Tell us about this amazing piece. It's a show stopper for sure and a real highlight of, um, of the exhibition. Um, I know it began for you with one strand of bamboo that you saw, I think it was in a secondhand store and um, the idea of, of working with bamboo seems to have been planted and how did it come to fruition? Well, it's always very strange. It's like, you know, I, was, I just happened to be in like the dollar store for some reason. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you know, you never know what you can find. You never you know? know. Treasures are everywhere. <laughs> so I happened to find that sort of one piece of that bamboo curtain. Mm -hmm. You can it's sort of the only odd sort of form that's sort of there on the on your right left. There, right? Yeah. And uh, I don't know, I just sort of bought it. I don't know why. And it wasn't important at that moment, but I, I, I think it was, I bought it because I sort of liked the whole idea of transferring imagery onto bamboo. That was sort of interesting to me. So I bought it, held on to it, as I do a lot of things. You know, I may, it's the impulse of something that sort of I'm intrigued by, mm -hmm. not sure when it will sort of find its way into the work. Um, and then I happened to have this residency at the Fabric Workshop Museum in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And then I decided that I wanted to make uh, the Architectural Forest, uh, which was really a prop for a performance. So uh, 
so really it sort of creates, it's really this architectural structure that Bunny Boy lives inside of, which is a sound suit, which probably you don't have pictures of, but. I don't think I do. Uh, so he lives within, amongst the forest. Mm -hmm. And this also makes sound. Right. And then there's performance that uh, where he, I mean, he never can come out of the forest. Uh, so you see him passing through and sort of coming right up to the edge. And, and uh, then there's this other larger performance component that's, that's uh, um, part of, of, of the project. Um, but I was really interested in... Uh, Using this material and, and the fact that I could digitally print onto it, mm -hmm. which then as you sort of move around the piece, it's almost like a pixelated sort of film mm -hmm. because there's so much that reveals itself as you sort of move through <laughs> through the piece. Um, and I like the sort of sound component. So it's really sort of creating this sort of space, uh, place, um, well, I definitely encourage it's all of you sacred. to look. Yeah, there really is a sacredness to the to the piece. And as you walk around, I like the pixelation. That's a nice way, I think, of, of thinking about it, too. But you really are rewarded by carefully looking. If you look really carefully, you'll see these kind of hidden motifs, like the leopard's head and the car and the rainbow. So like all of Nick's work, I think slowing down and looking, you know, taking the time to really look is... Um, is important. Um, well, that brings us to this uh, amazing um, set of four wall pieces, which are just these incredibly dense assemblages of found objects. And I thought this would be a good piece to talk about. And here we have a, a detail where you can see some of the um, the ceramic figurines and the metal flowers, the antique gramophones, um, the 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 bee, the strands of beads, and of course the amazing chandelier um, pieces as well. Um, could you maybe talk a little bit about how you source these found objects from secondhand stores? Uh, you know, this piece is, is called Garden Plots. Uh, but you know, when it comes to sourcing, I went to an antique mall today, actually. We sure did. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was fortunate enough to get to go um, in a, antiquing with Nick in Nashville in a couple of times, too. Yeah. So there's a shot. Isn't the other image me carrying something that I bought? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there we are in Nashville um, with that piece. I mean, this is amazing, this yes. piece. Why don't you tell them what your plans so, are? So, you know, like, the interesting thing about when I saw this piece, I saw the back of the piece. Mm -hmm. So it was sort of like, you know, it was just sort of this. And so from the back, I just was like, whoa. Mm -hmm. You know, that's like arms up. Yeah. But in the front, it was this. Mm -hmm. And so I just sort of, that's that sort of like that real sort of edgy kind of disturbing factor that sort of is critical to the work. Mm -hmm. And so this is all out of wood. Um, I'm not sure exactly what it was for, but it's going to be part of a new sound suit that will be at the Smithsonian. But, um, but again, I'm interested in that, you know, that it's going to be on the, sort of on the back of, of the body, sort of above, up here. And... I'm not quite sure of the, the position in terms of whether or not he will be facing behind or facing mm -hmm. forward, but. And you're gonna paint the I think it's loaded with a lot. <laughs> so we can, we and sort of know just, what's going on here. You were gonna paint the, the back of it black, right? Yeah, yes. completely black, yeah. yeah. So that'll be an incredibly powerful piece. Um, but going back to just the sourcing of objects in general, um, it seems like there's a lot of different things going on there, whether it's a commentary on our materialism in, in the States or um, this idea of memory. Well, you know, there's so much surplus out here, you know. Yes. What I tend to do is like me and Bob, who's mm -hmm. my partner, you know, we'll just get a one-way ticket to like 
Washington State. Mm -hmm. And then we'll just rent a cargo van. We'll pull out our phones and we'll just like flea markets, antique malls, our way back to Chicago. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Sounds like so much fun. And so that's how we're resourcing, but that is also how I'm sort of, I'm finding right now that I'm just building work in the moment. Mm -hmm. Like, it's amazing how many pieces I build just by being out and about and, and sort of scouting. It's really fascinating. It's fabulous. It's like when I'm on, I'm just like on. He's like, oh, what about this? And I'm like, just so, I'm like, don't distract me. I'm like, <laughs> in this, <laughs> something yes. about, it's, I'm in a zone, something's happening. Mm -hmm. And, you know, these works just start to come together mm -hmm. in this, the most sort of remarkable way. Mm -hmm. Just like the piece that we we saw that it sparks an idea and you know yeah because you're probably and Bob's like why does he want this <laughs> and then once I say well you know look at the stance I mean there's so much information here mm -hmm. that can be misread and so that's what's interesting and so it's really about you know I'm not you know there's surplus that I need in terms of standard but then I'm always very open to just new ways of sort of thinking about work and um you know I wanted to go here just to see what was is it any different here than you know other places and not so different <laughs> <laughs> we we both commented this looks just like you know the thrift stores in in the yeah. states um I just wanted to throw this picture in because in my studio I, yes I feel so fortunate to have been able to have a glimpse into his storage look base. I am not a hoarder by right. no means <laughs> Trust me, all of this, what you see here, would probably create three pieces, three sounds. It takes so much material. Um, and so basically when we're building work, that's really what we do. It's that we go out and resource and we basically use everything up. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I'm pretty much very clean and very sort of minimal in terms of like, how he I really live is. And, I mean, I, I can attest to that. And even yeah. this is incredibly organized. Oh, it's or, yeah, and I it guess has that's to my be. point is like the red birds are all together, the yellow birds. Are, well, I mean, it's I mean. super. <laughs> um, you, you are definitely not a hoarder. Um, so I'm looking at the time and realizing we're already um, approaching when we're supposed to allow people ask, to ask questions. And there's still a lot more that I wanted to, to say. Um, the rescue piece, I think, does that also speak to some of the conceptual reasons of kind of rescuing these objects that have been discarded and kind of giving them positions of value again? They were once beloved, then they're, you know, that, given away. And also, you know, sort of class and power. You know, I think, you know, it's interesting because we were out thrifting one day. Bob happened to find this sort of Doberman that was reclining, and he's like, you should really look at this dog. It's amazing. And I was like, ah, I don't know. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and then I went to look at it, and it was really quite extraordinary. It had this sort of very sort of 19, sort of 40s, sort of Americana look to him, and I was really sort of fascinated by it. And then, you know, as I'm looking at it, I'm thinking like, Okay, I need to find a gold settee. As one does. I mean, this, right, and he's like, what? I said, he has to be on a gold settee. Mm -hmm. And so we were out and about. Did I find one? But the interesting thing about that story is that, so we're in this one sort of antique mall. We're talking. The sale person's comes up and says, you know, is there something I can help you with? And we're like, well, we're talking about this sort of goat tea, and, you know, can we bring in our dog? <laughs> and he's like, what are these, what is going on here? So he said, sure. <laughs> so Bob then goes and gets the dog and on his shoulder. Yeah. And so we then set it on the sofa, on the settee. And because, again, it's really about sort of, 
you know, the fit and sort of, you know, then how do you sort of build from that? Because this, the actual furniture becomes the actual sort of foundation for the structure to be built around and sort of creating these sort of dens and, and sort of safe sort of spaces. Um, and so it's that sort of thing which then led to this sort of series of, of works. Mm -hmm. There's more than one of these rescues. Um, I also, do you want to speak just a moment about the hustle coat? This was a piece that I had hoped would be in my exhibition in Nashville, but there wasn't room, and I'm delighted that it's reappeared in some of the other, or it has appeared in um, the other venues. Um, I don't feel like I know as much about these as I'd like to. Do you want to just speak well, you know, to I those a little? I think this is really sort of, again, sort of, you know, me sort of thinking about, like, as a kid, you know, this is what I saw. You know, it's like, you know, it's, you know, you know, being sort of, let's say, just sort of on the streets, like with my parents and shopping and somebody would come and sort of flash their coat open with jewelry. And so to me, it really sort of came from that. But it also sort of comes from this place of, you know, you've, you've got to get your hustle on in order to sort of make things happen. So it's really about that. It's about consumerism. It's about just sort of like excess and and uh, this whole sort of uh, exploiting sort of that and uh, clout and, you know, the role of jewelry and what it sort of represents in terms of class. And Is there any, I wonder if these are almost if these are related to the sound suit in the sense of oh, yeah. like judgment and um, you know we think of people that work on Wall Street and their buttoned up trench coats as being you know very honest and you know hardworking people but the re <laughs> <laughs> but the reality is if you like look deeper that when you get behind these kind of superficial exterior you know displays that you know they're just trying to hustle you you know more than maybe the guy selling hot items on yeah, the I corner. I think it's really, yeah, uh, to that as, uh, as well as anything else. I think it's really sort of, again, it's, it's one of these sort of, you know, again, it's one of these sort of moments where, you know, we all are sort of, we all have our strategies and sort of gain mm -hmm. face on in terms of how we navigate and what that all means. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, shifting gears just a little bit, um, I and many other people have noticed there's definitely an, an increased urgency in a lot of your work. It seems like since the Trayvon Martin killing and Michael Brown, that some of these issues that you used to talk about wanting to seduce people with the beauty of your objects and then kind of gently maybe expressing some of these deeper concepts now are kind of full on and you're not hiding them as much, if you will. And I feel like this sound suit in particular um, with the, the silver, the gray buttons, it really seems to be a suit of armor, you know, made out of metal. And then um, do you want to maybe speak to what the, the head of this sound suit represents? Well, this is really sort of how I sort of move through the world, actually. You know, it's like with this filter. You know, and so I can look out, but you can't see in. Mm. Uh, so it's really sort of comes from that place, but it also comes from this place of, of not being heard. Uh, you know, with so much, sort of, gun violence, and and yet, you know, people are not, people aren't speaking up. So you know, this sort of shape of this sort of tuba, it's really sort of creating this sort of, you know, it really is sort of about sound and this sort of sense of echo and urgency through, through, through that. But. Um, the piece upstairs is um, underneath, as you can sort of see here, there's um, a target that's built inside of, of, of the piece. Uh, and then the, on the outside of the suit is uh, blue and black, uh, which is very slightly shifts in color, but you know, that's uh, blue and black is police, uh, and red, green, green and black is the African American flag. So. It really sort of, again, sort of uh, looking at uh, these two um, situations and, and somehow sort of 
bringing them together uh, in this sort of very sort of disturbing sort of um, concealed, I think, sort of form. Mm -hmm. But I was interested in sort of this sort of uh, form uh, as a as a concealer as well as uh, something that we know that makes sound, but it's silenced mm. at the same time. Right. Um, and this is, these are installation shots from a, a massive uh, exhibition at Mass Mocha in the western part of Massachusetts. And um, here you have that's opening, Do you want to talk about the cloud? Yeah, this is opening uh, in uh, three weeks in Scotland, in Glasgow, um, at Tramway. Um, or, I mean, here, obviously. And so, yeah, this is a good island. place to start. Mm -hmm. So, like, when you walk into this exhibition, it's, it's sort of this field, this sort of forest of spinners. Uh, that I had custom made. Uh, so from, a, like when you walk into the exhibition, they hang from above to the floor and they have motors at the top, so they're all spinning. Uh, I mean, it's like amazing, amazing when you see it, but then as you get closer, you find what is so amazing is guns and bullets and teardrops, so not so amazing. Uh, and so it's really, again, and I was interested in this object because I was just sort of thinking about, you know, we live in a world where we just do not, we just sort of dismiss what we think is not in our backyards. And yet is very much so is. And so I wanted to use that element to really talk about that what we are sort of dealing with, what is going on in the world is closer to us than we think. Um, and so then you walk through this sort of kinetic sort of forest that leads to this crystal cloudscape, which is then this sort of enormous sort of object that's hovering above your head there. Uh, and that came about when I was invited to do this project at Mass Mocha, Denise Marconish, who's the curator, came into the studio in Chicago and, and talked to me about uh, Gallery 5, which is the largest space at Mass Mocha. Football field size, yeah. I mean, huge. And so she said, you know, I want to give you this gallery. We want you to do whatever you want, which is exactly the projects I <laughs> desire. <laughs> um, <laughs> And so she said, I'm going to leave you, and I will be back in a year. Uh, and I wasn't thinking about the project at all until Freddie Gray happened. Mm. And so, and Denise was coming maybe two months later. Mm -hmm. And I was in the studio working on uh, a project, and I, sat, I was sitting there, and I was thinking is the racism in heaven based on, on that incident. And so that's how this, the crystal cloud scape came about. Uh, that was the catalyst for that project. And so, you know, again, it's, it's, it's the sort of epic, sort of disturbing sort of moments in history in our lives that sort of provoke me to sort of create the sort of monumental works that also, again, there's this amazing performance element, uh, communing sort of device that's built into the project as well, so. I, I will note that this um, piece will be in North America in 2020. It'll be down at the Crystal Bridges Museum in Arkansas, and having seen it for myself, I know I'm gonna make a pilgrimage, and you all might wanna consider it too. It's worth the trip for sure. Um, should we skip this one for time, or do you want to say anything briefly about it? <laughs> I'll say something briefly about okay. it. So th this is uh, this is from a series of, of ton that are called tondos, but it's from an exhibition titled um, 
if a tree falls, Mm -hmm. or is it if a tree falls? I can't remember. (laughs) I think it is. Or is it? Oh, I don't know. Uh, But this is me sort of, the research came out of me looking at brain scans of youth that are sort of growing up in sort of gun violence zones. And so colliding those images with extreme weather patterns. And so this is what happens. This is all wire and bugle beads. They're amazing pieces. Um, Well, once again, shifting just a little bit here in conclusion, um, you have been saying the last two days that we've been together that um, you really want to start focusing on happiness. And um, I'd love to hear more about that, as I'm sure you all would be interested in knowing too. Um, I will certainly say that one of the happiest I've been and as connected to my community as I felt in a long time was when we um, we uh, produced the wonderful performance in Nashville that was two years in the making of us really getting to know our community. You charged us with sourcing the talent. You said, I could bring a troupe from Chicago, but that's not the point. You know, the point is for the community to be introduced to itself and to bring people who don't always have visibility or a stage, to bring them to, uh, you know, to let the spotlight be on them for a moment. So I'm wondering, um, if we could talk about the performative aspect or the performance part of your practice, and also just even more generally, um, you often talk about seeing yourself as being a messenger and as an artist with a civic responsibility. And it seems to me like that's manifest um, at at its highest element through these performances. And I'm wondering if you just maybe want to share a little bit about the performance in the five minutes that we have left. Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, I think, you know, once I realized I was a messenger, I became much more liberated. So I'm not, I'm not, I don't really sort of operate under the peer pressure of being an artist. I don't really think about it like that. So, because I think that I'm, you know, my work is much bigger than whatever that means. Um, and so it allows me to sort of think about uh, a much bigger purpose in terms of, of, of my role as a sort of artist. Um, and so for me, it's not about the museums and institutions for me in terms of, I get it. It's really, for me, what's most important is me working within community. And and, um, it's, you know, it's everything. It's like, and particularly, you know, what the audience sees is really not where the work really happens. It's really sort of the sort of preparation and the sort of behind the scenes uh, and the building of a project. And then the testimonies that happen at the conclusion of a project when we all sort of come back together. Uh, I mean, this moment is like everything. This moment tells me exactly why I do what I do, uh, because it's life because it's life changing. And so this is the performance that we did in Nashville, working with the community, building the performance piece. Feet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So this, and so this is the, after the performance had happened. And we, we had three different acts in our performance. Yeah. So blanket statement is um, where these blankets that were woven by members of the community out of pony beads. Um, and we worked with a lot of social services agencies. Um, a group of former prostitutes, um, a group of homeless people who came and laid these blankets on you as um, a spoken word poet performed. And then there was this large mound that you crawled out from under and then dragged the beads All of this dead weight, right? Yes. So that was the first act. Um, And then And then this is upright uh, performance where we worked with a number of social services. Um, Well, we took individuals that 
where uh, I think one facility was uh, uh, youth and, and, and uh, individuals that were living with HIV. Uh, and so they became part of practitioners or, or initiates <laughs> building of uh, this work uh, in addition to other people. And, and so, you know, this piece is a rite of passage. This is about empowerment. It's about uh, validation. Uh, and then also accompanying this sort of building of a sound suit also was a 60 piece choir. Oh my gosh, they were amazing. Yeah, so. Amazing. And these initiates are dressing the practitioners in a sound suit for a process that took 20, 20 minutes. minutes at least. And it was, you know, a very loving bestowal of. Um, of value on these these figures, and then last but certainly not least, was heard, heard where. <laughs> um. <laughs> well, we worked with uh, a number of dance companies, mm -hmm. a number of universities that had dance program, uh, and and really sort of built this sort of performance piece that. Uh, and play the music with that. This, I still think, was one of my favorite parts of our project, was working with the youth at um, Pearl Cone High School, which is a, um, marching. Uh, their marching band. And they're a school that had been really negatively impacted by gun violence recently. We had learned that you know 16 kids in the last couple of years, either current students or very recent grads, had been killed. And, you know, I was also struck, I live in Nashville, and like, I don't, he, I, I thought we lived in a very safe city. I didn't really know that how, what an issue it was for us. And so to be able to utilize these kids and to have, for many of them, their first time being in the symphony, which is, we're, Nashville's very proud of its new symphony mm -hmm. building. Not only are they going to the symphony, they're performing at the symphony, and talk about just, you know, validation it was, it was incredible. And then at where we started, this is where you can see people are taking their bows. And by the end of this, there were well over 300 people on the stage, you know, from all different backgrounds. And now we're back to here where afterwards, as, as Nick said, like this is what it was all about, is that mm -hmm. opportunity for everybody to reflect and talk about this, this journey. Super impactful. And Nick has tasked us, and the first takes this very seriously, making sure that these seeds that were planted during this, this process, that you know, they're allowed to grow and bloom. OK, well, Whoa. last but not least, Nick, you want to tell us about what is currently happening so, in Chicago? Yeah. So this is a, uh, I just bought a building recently, which is this here. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's called Facility. It's uh, 24,000 square feet. Uh, I live up there. It's important that my studio and live space is in the same building. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, again, a large part of my sort of studio practice is sort of outreach. And so, you know, as we were sort of moving into the building, we were also thinking about the community. And so the first project was this sort of piece that, you know, I was thinking about like, you know, when you move into your house and your neighbor, somebody brings over an apple pie, you know, the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I was thinking like, okay, let's sort of look at that as a model of, as a way of sort of how do we want to introduce ourselves to the community. And so these are all small round sort of tags that we sort of uh, sent to every public school, every business within uh, the area where they were to then sort of write their names and uh, or through a drawing. Then all of these were then returned back to facility. And then where it's all white is the drawings. And it spells love thy neighbor. And so that was our sort of way of introducing ourselves to the neighborhood, uh, you know, through this outreach and this sort of community-based sort of project. Uh, but facility is a, is a place that houses uh, 
my studio, Bob's Design Firm, uh, my brother Jack, who's an artist who lives up there on the other side. Uh, and it's all, but it's a, it's a place where we, uh, these are three storefronts in the front. And so behind the storefronts is where everything happens, but you don't have access to the, to the studios. Uh, these three storefronts will be converted into uh, project spaces. We may invite artists to do installations in the windows. Uh, it may be retail, you know. Uh, whatever we choose to do, uh, we can do in this building. And the facility is about facilitating and making things happen and, and creating sort of space for uh, uh, creative sort of output to sort of happen. So I've been here a year. It's like so exciting. <laughs> oh my God. And so, um, I did pull all the weeds in the front. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I think this just demonstrates not only your commitment, but just your generosity to your community, to our communities. And you certainly practice what you're, you preach in your everyday life. And that, that genuineness certainly comes through in, in your work.